I get along with pretty much everybody. I, I can feel who they are when I meet them initially, mm-hmm. and I can sort of understand them. And so I understand the dog. I understand the person. I think that's really important skills as yeah. a trainer to have. You have to communicate with two legs yeah. and four legs. Yep, exactly. Hey everyone, welcome to this inaugural mm-hmm. edition of Dog Sense. I'm Kathy Santo and I'm here with Sarah Bayless. And this is the episode that I've been dreading. <laughs> We've been prepping for this one for weeks, and it's always really important to do the origin story, but your origin story is literally 30 plus years long. So in order to cram this all into one episode, we are, we're doing some highlight reels, basically. Yeah, I started dog training when I was three years old. <laughs> okay, no. But there's nothing I dislike more than talking about myself. So it's good that Sarah's here to pull the information out of me because I'd really rather jump into dog training. But this must be done. So let's just I promise I'll ask all the good questions. Okay. Okay. So first things first, what everyone wants to know is how did you start training dogs? I started training because my family had a great Pyrenees, and the dog was a year older than I was. And I remember I was like six or seven, and my parents came home from a dog training class, and they had totally failed out of it. And they were like, oh, the dog, she's terrible. She, she's dumb, right? And I thought, oh, well, I can do things better than them anyway in general. Um, and so I decided I was going to train Teddy myself. And so what I did was I would go into the refrigerator and open the deli drawer and sneak out the deli meat. And I, in a few weeks, had her trained. She could do tricks. I did a show for them. It was awesome. And the best part is like 20 years later, dog is long gone. And we're at Thanksgiving dinner. And I say, you guys, you know what was really funny? I would train her. And you know, I used turkey meat. My mother was like, what? And I was like, yeah, the deli meat. And she was like, I changed delis three times. I thought they were shorting me. Oh, oh my, my God. Yeah, she, it was amazing. And you know what? You think time heals all wounds? Yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> She's still mad. Sorry, Mom. And we still tell people to use deli meat to train their dogs. Yeah, it's awesome. So that's how I started. I just knew that I want. I was fascinated by dog behavior yeah. and everything involving the dog. So, yeah, that was my training grounds. And it's really awesome to be exposed to it at such a young age. So we always, like, whenever families want to bring their kids in for classes, we think it's such a valuable thing to get the kids involved in training because you could really spark something in them. And it also, help, of course, helps to build a relationship with the dog as well. Yeah, dogs are great teachers. You yeah. learn a lot about yourself and your dog and – if the dog fails at something, it's most likely you and, and just how to communicate better and they forgive you and they're your best friends, the yeah. whole thing. All right. So when did you first – like as an adult, how did you kind of then get back into training after your family dog? I just always wanted to be a dog trainer. Hmm. I just love dogs. And so when I graduated high school, my family was like, hey, guess what? You're not going to go to college because you're a girl and you should be a secretary. So – I was actually a secretary in their friend's big insurance company in New York City. And I was like, this is terrible. I'm leaving. And so I gave two weeks notice at the job. I gave two weeks notice to my family. They didn't think I was going. And I left. And I remember when I was pulling out of the driveway, my mother screaming at me, don't you get a dog when you leave. (laughs) So I drove to the airport, picked up my Boyfriend at the time, now my husband, who I had flown to Newark, and we drove down to Georgia. And before I even got back to the place we were living, the townhome, I stopped at the shelter and picked up a dog. Of course I did. <laughs> of course. First thing you did. Um, all right. So this first dog, so you kind of went to the shelter. And at that point, did you kind of know what you were looking for in a dog? I wanted a Doberman. Okay. And I picked out a dog that they said was a Doberman, and it never got bigger than 12 pounds, oh, but it was God. black and tan. I'm like, okay, it's a Doberman. They're like, it's a Doberman. Miniature Pincher? <laughs> no. Oh, thought miniature, for sure. Miniature Hound. It was, it was reality check. It was never growing. I'm yeah, like, yeah. I'm not feeding it enough. And then it got heavy, and I'm like, oh, it's not a Doberman. So anyway, um, I took it to classes, and then we were walking through a pet store one day, and I saw a Doberman, and it was on sale because it was big, and it couldn't fit in its crate. And so I – Took it, and I literally carried it screaming out of the pet store on my shoulder as we went up the escalator. Oh, God. Uh, and that was Clapton. Clapton had a lot of challenges. Um, he was afraid of life. He'd never been outside. And I took him to a formal training class because Dallas, the first dog, who ultimately wound up living with my grandfather, um, Dallas was just chill. Mm-hmm. But Clapton, 
It was it was a challenge. And there is where I saw people training dogs for competition obedience. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, I want to do that. Yeah. And from there, somebody said, you should, you know, Clapton's great, but, you know, if you want another dog, you start with a sporting group dog. Mm-hmm. And then you somebody who had a litter of golden retrievers, and then that's that was that whole thing where I got yeah. Opal. All right. So an Opal is then what brought you from kind of doing your own pet dog training to now we're moving into competition obedience. Right. And so Clapton and Opal were about a year apart. Okay. And Did they get along? They did. All right, cool. But Clapton had his own agenda. Well, Clapton was your first kind of experience with a dog with behavioral issues, right? Where you really had to work through things and problem solve in a way that what you weren't getting from your other trainers. And that happens a lot. And remember, this is before the internet. I can't believe I'm saying that. I can't believe there was a before <laughs> the internet. Like, And I rode a dinosaur to the pet store. No. And so when you needed dog training information, you had to figure it out yourself. Yeah. And so somebody at the training club had said, well, you want to make sure he's not aggressive, so put your hand in his food bowl. I'm like, okay. So I put my hand in his food bowl, and he put his mouth on my face and bit me. <laughs> and I was ble- and I yelled, and my husband, at the time boyfriend, came out and said, he's like, what's the matter? And I had blood running down my face, and he was like, did he do this to you? And I'm like, yes, but we're going to fix it. <laughs> I don't know how, but we're going to fix this. And so I took him back to the club, like, the next day and said, hey, that crap that you told me to do <laughs> didn't work. And they're like, oh, this is what you have to do. You have to get rid of him or put him to sleep or you have to, like, beat him. And I'm like, you know what? That's great. No, I'm not doing it. And also, that. this was in a time when the whole kind of the way that people train dogs was a lot more heavy-handed than it is now. Oh, sure. It was, um, I don't know. It was just <laughs> get it done. Like, put yeah. a choke chain on the dog. And I think they call it the pop and jerk method. Yes. So there wasn't any real science to it, and, and not even science. There wasn't any thought about the dog. Yeah. And so I'm like, yeah, no, that's not going to work for me. And so I worked through it, and a lot of trial and error, and mostly error. Yeah. And then we finally – I can't even tell you how we did it. We finally came to the realization that, all right, you know, we can live together. Mm-hmm. I can give you stuff. I'll t- I take stuff, but I'm fair. And yeah. it was just – it was rough. But we got through it. And it was during that time of working through it that – I got the golden because somebody mm-hmm. told me this lady who trains in competition obedience yeah. has a litter of puppies, and I reached out to her, and I got this puppy. And so there I was in Georgia with a dog I was training to be competitive. Mm-hmm. Then I wasn't using any of the trainers at the school I was in Georgia. Right. This one was in New York. And so it's crazy to think that I trained the dog yeah. by phone. Mm-hmm. I would take videotapes, yeah. videotapes, this, the yeah. big one. This is amazing. You have, to, all right, you have to tell this part of the story. All right. So I would teach, like, the broad jump. And so I would call up Diana and say, hey, Diana, I want to do the broad jump. And she'd say, do this, this, and this. Cool. I'd go do this and this and this, and I'd video it. And I'd send her the tape. So, like, a week passes, and I call her. I'm like, hey, did you get the tape? She's like, yeah, I did. I'm like, did you look at it? She's like, yeah, I did. I'm like, okay, so how do I fix that? She's like, well, what do you think you should do? I'm like, dude, that's why I called you. And she's like, yeah, but come up with three ideas of how to fix it and run it by me, and I'll let you know. If they're right. And I'm yeah. like, are you kidding me right now? I was so mad. I mean, that's how our training relationship went. But you know what it did? It grew me as a trainer. It grew me into the trainer I am now. You can problem solve. I couldn't search it online. Yeah. I couldn't ask other people because they were doing a method I totally didn't want to do. So I figured it out. Yeah. And yeah, more more error in trial. <laughs> <laughs> and who was Opal as a dog? Um, Opal was an amazing golden retriever. I thought she and I had the best bond in the whole world. Like, I thought we were soulmates, and then I learned about separation issues. (laughs) Actually, (laughs) we were soulmates, but she also had separation issues. So we had a lot of trouble with stays in the ring. We we got past them. I remember one time I was just at my wit's end, and and nobody really was helping me. It just didn't work for her. Mm -hmm. And I was making lunch one day, and I was like, wait a minute tuna fish cans. Mm -hmm. And I put them down. I put her paws on them. And Mm -hmm. I made her sit with her front feet on the can. And when she stepped off, I said, ah, ah, ah. And I could see she was like, oh, it's my front paws that you don't like moving. I'm like, yeah, it's exactly what I don't like. And that really helped it. Awesome. But again, you know, it wasn't a search. It was just frustration and and the need to fix something, which created, you know, the creativity, I think. Yeah. All right. So with Opal, how far did you get with her with her competing? She went from novice A, which is in our sport, the first dog you have. You're in novice A, you're in open A, you're in utility A. 
Um, I went from novice A to an obedience trial championship, mm -hmm. and I started showing her when she was two, mm -hmm. and I got the championship when she was like three and a half, four. That's incredible. Um, yeah, the fact that you could take a novice A dog and get a championship was pretty good. Yeah. Um, I had, you know, I had Diane. She was helping me, and at that point, I was in Florida. I think when I started competing with mm -hmm. her. So that was a whole nother group of people that were doing things differently. Yeah. And obedience stuff didn't trickle down to Florida fast. Yeah. So they were like three years behind the curve. So the things that I was doing with Diane that I brought to Florida, they yeah. were like, what are you doing? That's, That's really weird. cool. Yeah. It was funny because when I went to the club, I was like, hi, I'm Kathy. I want friends. And they're like, <laughs> you're weird and we're threatened by you, so stop it. Yeah. And I was like, okay, no friends but blue ribbons. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And then that's eventually when people wanted to start training with me. Yeah. So that's when you started teaching clients. Yeah. because And I, I was so surprised. Well, I actually, when I was in Georgia and I was working with Clapton, I had a neighbor in the town house next to us who mm -hmm. said, you're really good. Could you train my Irish wolfhound and my twins? <laughs> I'm like, yes to the wolfhound, no to the twins, because that's going to be a lot more time and money. Yeah. We, tra I, we always yeah. say we train dogs, not kids and husbands or wives. Yeah, it's a longer program. So, yeah. But then in Florida, I think people saw my success in the ring yeah. competing, and then they wanted to work with me. And it was fun. I mean, again, it was – I was training them. I knew more than they did, but it was still a lot of learning. Yeah. And it was great to be putting my hands on different dogs mm -hmm. and, you know, solving problems from a different perspective. Yeah. So did you do any other sports while you were down in Florida? Hmm. I did agility. I did agility back in its heyday. Like when it began, it was yeah. – if you watched USDA agility back then, it's crazy because if your dog would heal with you, you could basically heal it fast to yeah, the yeah. next obstacle, <laughs> tell it to do it, then heal it again to the next thing. So you had no off courses. It was crazy. And so I had a student with little Jack Russell, and she wanted me to do agility with the dog. So basically when I lived there – I would train the dog and compete with it. And then when I moved back to Jersey, she would still fly me down to compete with it. Mm -hmm. And one day I was – she was a novice, right? So there's three levels and then there's – it was um, a national qualifier. Okay. Now, the people who qualify for nationals and go to nationals, they're like experts. Yeah. They've been doing it forever. Their dogs have high-level titles. I had this little novice dog. So I remember doing my novice run through and I – qualified, didn't win, but I was like, yeah, I got through. It was like 10 obstacles. Yeah. And I was feeling pretty good. And the owner said to me, you have one more class. And I'm like, oh, oh no, I don't. I have one. They did it. And mm -hmm. she's like, no, no, no. I've entered you in the regional qualifier. <laughs> Surprise. <I'm> like, <laughs> no. <laughs> I, there's like 32 jumps in there. And the obstacles are used multiple times. It's yeah. like a brain twist. She's like, no, I have great faith in you. Ugh. So I'm like, well, good, because I don't. So I gave her the dog, and I sat outside the ring for probably three hours oh my God. watching the classes. They go in height order, mm -hmm. big to small, and I memorized the course with a song. I made up a song in my head to the tune of, I don't know, like uh, whatever I like to listen to at the yeah. time. And it was like, jump, jump, weave, A-frame teeter <laughs> tunnel, table for five, and jump, jump. It was awful. That's amazing. So anyway, <laughs> yeah, but for, that's insane. <laughs> Because I didn't want to fail. Like, that's yeah. my big thing. Like, I don't want to fail. So then when I did the walkthrough, humming my little tune, I'm sure people thought I lost my mind. And I went in the ring, and I did it, and I freaking qualified. So at this point, so this is a regional qualification now. Mm -hmm. So where does this bring you next? This brings me to the Northeastern Regional Championship. <laughs> with your little Jack Russell. My little novice dog. Who's got a novice title competing against dogs with their championships? Yeah. yeah, it was awesome. So I went to Cleveland, Ohio in August. Mm -hmm. Do you know how hot Cleveland, Ohio is in August? I can imagine. Really hot. I still have like skin damage from <laughs> the sunburn I have. It's terrible. And um, yeah, so I did my, I was like, well, I'm definitely not gonna qualify. Right. So this is good. I, there's six classes. So I'll be out of here. And I qualified in the first one. I'm like, Damn well, probably because you weren't expect like that helps the your state of mind when you're competing as well because you were like there was no pressure because you're, you're, there's no way, there's no, no way. way, no way. And then she qualified. Yeah, I was like, wow, we get to do another one. Thank you so much. <laughs> and then we did the second one, and she didn't qualify, and I was upset. Ooh, so yeah, now it's like switched. now I was like thinking, well, I was going to be on the podium, yeah. not really, but at least I was going to get to the next level, and yeah. I didn't. And then after that, that was – we did a little more, got some more advanced titles, and then we were done. Yeah. No more agility. No more. So com so competition, the obedience was your sport. 
It is. It's yeah. the I like the competition obedience. I like the anal retentiveness mm-hmm. of it. I like the problem solving of it. Yeah. Yeah. That's my lane. Yep. All right. So then in your story now, so after this, you still so how are you then kind of finding more clients? What other kind of dogs were you working with? I was asked by the shelter if I would come in. This was great. If I would temperament <laughs> test dogs oh, God. for adoption. Okay. I was like, wow, that sounds easy. Yeah. So I'd go to a kennel run and it would say, you know, Fifi and her family gave her up because, I don't know, allergies. Mm-hmm. Typical. Go in the run, close it. I'd be like, hey, Fifi. And Fifi would come at me to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and I would oh, extricate God. myself from the yeah. kennel run and I was like, <gasps> what the hell? I'm like, you got the sign wrong. <laughs> <laughs> this one. And I don't think it was allergies. No. <laughs> and they were like, no, that's what the family said. I'm like, you are lying to me. Yeah. But the file said allergies. This is when I found out that people lie. <laughs> oh, man. So then you were like, well, if it doesn't say on the card, how do I know? Right. So that means that you're not getting good information. So you have to figure it out yourself. Right. And – that's when I learned in the trenches about body language and what the dog is saying and how I can adjust how I'm moving and, and interacting to make the dog either more calm or not kill me or – and, like, I keep stressing this. There was nobody there to tell me. Yeah. They were just like, yeah, have fun. It was like going into a shark tank <laughs> and then – and no oxygen tank. It's like, have fun. And they didn't know either. Yeah, like, yeah. it's not their fault. The right. people who work there, mm-hmm. they didn't know. And yeah. that, then I started educating them. Right. So, yeah, it was it was the wild, wild west for sure. All right. So then after the shelter dogs, from there, where did you move next in your training? So around that time, I was doing group classes. I was mainly doing competition people privately. I was doing the shelter thing. And then I started doing a therapy dog program well before therapy dog program was a thing, I think. Because, again, we didn't have internet. Who the hell knew what was going on? Right. But you guys didn't ha- – you weren't doing, like, the certifications that they do now. No, no. Uh, we thought, oh, let's take dogs to school and teach mm-hmm. kids how to train and play and interact with dogs properly yeah. so they don't get bitten. And then from there, we did a program where um, you could take a dog somewhere and the kids could actually do the training mm-hmm. with you. It wasn't their dog. It was our dog's. And then we did a reading program, which is really funny because I don't think in the early 80s they were yeah. doing a read for pro- – but we thought, oh, this is cool. The kid could read the dog a mm-hmm. book. So, yeah, we were doing all that and it was fun and it was – was a lot between yeah. the competitions competing and the classes and the shelter and the therapy work. Yeah, we were pretty much maxed out every day, just like now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. So then from there, where did you go next in your training? So I moved back to Jersey when Ryan, our son at the time, was two mm-hmm. because I didn't want to raise him in Florida. I just liked the New Jersey vibe, you know, the seasons, all that stuff. So we moved back here. And, I was, and then I got a border collie named Trigger. And she was amazing. She was like the right dog at the mm-hmm. right time. I had the time. Um, and I really didn't want to get back into the competition obedience thing. Mm-hmm. Not that I was bored of it, maybe a little bit, but mostly I wasn't seeing the value in it. Mm-hmm. Because the school that I had in Florida had become a lot of, you know, students going, oh, well, she got a better score than me. Like, right. I want an extra lesson. Oh, it wasn't straight. It was just like, there's got to be something more. Yeah. And so the shelters work fulfilled me, yeah. but I didn't do a lot of it. Mm-hmm. And so then I was up here and I was training Trigger in the backyard and my husband's a chiropractor and he has a home office and patients would come in and see me training through mm-hmm. the trees right, right. and they'd be like, excuse me, my puppy, he's on the rug, can you help? And I'd be like, sure, just ask him for my number. Yeah. And so I would say within two months I was back up and running as doing lessons and classes. It was wild. So, and so at this point it was, so no, you've moved away from the competition obedience students. We're just working with pet dog people now. Correct. And was I was a huge happy. Change for you though? Like like the kinds of questions and the kind of issues that you were dealing with, how like was it a big change from the competition world? It was a big change because number one, I didn't have the same dedication to training. Yeah. Right. And I also didn't have the same standard. Right. People came to me, they wanted to win trials mm-hmm. with their dogs like I did. So yeah. I got that mentality. Yeah. And people would come to me with these sob stories and these big challenges. Mm-hmm. And I'd be like, okay, so you got to train X amount of time a day and do it like this and this and this. And they wouldn't. And they'd come at the next week and they'd be like, it didn't work. And I'm like, well, you know, what'd you do? And they said, well, we tried it when we got home and it didn't work. I'm like, oh, <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not that. And, and then – 
they would say, well, can you train the dog right. and maybe keep it for a few hours and yeah, do some yeah. training? And and that's how we got into that. But I also, this was a really big turning point for me. The way I wanted a dog to be with me and live yeah. with me, I realized that not everybody wanted that with their dog. Yeah. And and I I let it be okay. Yeah. Not right away. <laughs> I can't, I, yeah, I can't imagine you being okay with that quite very quickly. No. So my first thing was try to pull them to my side. Yeah, yeah. Like you want to live like this with your dog. You want to have that relationship that I think is yeah, the yeah. best relationship. And then you get older and you realize that everybody wants the relationship they want with their dog. Mm-hmm. Not everybody wants yeah. this that I want. And then I made it okay. And, and now it's just like part of my life. Like yeah. I totally get that. I speak that language yeah. now. Well, I was going to say is that's in your – learning how to teach all different kinds of people. This was like the huge turning point into now this new student. Yeah, it really was key to understanding them. And again, what are you looking up on the internet? You're not. There's like, there's nothing right. there. You And I've always had a really good connection with people. I get along with pretty much everybody. I, I can feel who they are when I meet them initially, mm-hmm. and I can sort of understand them. And so I understand the dog, I understand the person. I think that's really important skills as yep. a trainer to have. You have to communicate with two legs yep. and four legs. Yep, exactly. All right. So from there, things got exciting. <laughs> so what – so how did you wind up – so I think it all started with the book deal, right? Yeah. So <laughs> this is just wild. So I was – somehow somebody asked me to do DVDs yeah. on dog trading. Like, okay, sure. And one of the production people said, I want to train my dog – and I said, oh, I don't have any spots left because I was a one-person show right, at that right. point. But I wrote up a little something, and it can help you. And yeah, so I yeah. gave it to her. And that's what I gave. Anybody who wanted to train with me, if I didn't have a spot, I would give them that. Right. And she said, well, this is a book. And I'm like, oh, I guess you can call it that. She's like, no, it's legit a book. I'm yeah. like, okay. She goes, well, I have some friends. I'll see mm-hmm. how what it can do. Maybe you want to publish it. I'm like, for sure, whatever. And then she called me back, and she said, um, my friend is an editor at Knopf. I didn't know Kanaf. I was like, what? And she said, he wants to meet with you. I'm like, oh, that's nice. Where are they? She goes, New York. And I'm like, ugh. (laughs) I had to drive to New York. Now, mind you, people spend years sending these things to publishers Mm -hmm. to try to get in the door. I had no idea. I'm like, oh, my God, I have to drive to New York. It's 30 minutes away without traffic. Yeah, And city driving. And city driving, right? But, like, I should have been like, but I didn't know. So I go there and I'm like, well, I'm in the wrong freaking building because yeah. it says Random House and they said Knopf. <laughs> and I go to the guy in the way and there's Martha Stewart books. And I'm like, hi, I'm lost. I'm looking for Knopf. He goes, well, it's part of this company. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. Long story short, I go up. I meet with the editor. We talk about his grandmother's Jack Russell. Now he wants a dog. Yeah. And we talk about that. And then I leave and he calls me in the car and he's like, I want to publish your book. I'm like, okay. Yeah. But, and I And I look at myself back then. I'm like. You didn't even know to yeah. be scared. Yeah. You didn't even know how big this was. Exactly, exactly. I was like, all right, that's cool. So then because of that, I got a lot of other things. Yeah. Um, they sent me on a two-week book tour. I took a dog with me. Um, I would do- and you, for the dog that you took with you, that was a client's dog? It was a client's dog. He was nine months old, and I looked at him. I'm like, you are coming on book tour with me. That's awesome. So Pop. he was kind of your demo dog for stuff? <laughs> That's yeah. Awesome. So book tour is terrifying. Yeah. Because every day you fly to a different city yeah. and you have a media escort at every single city. Yeah. And you are going to book signings and you don't know, are people going to show up? Like, right. I didn't know. Right. Who knew me? <laughs> so how many, how big, like, were your book signings crazy? They were. Because it was That's dogs. Awesome. Yeah. It's dogs. Yeah. yeah. So I bring Danny. I do some demos. I answer their questions. I pre-signed books before. I, yeah. I went there in the morning, pre-signed, did something, did TV or radio, yeah. came back, did the signing. And then the next morning jumped on a plane and went to the next yeah. city. And that went on for two weeks. Okay. Um, then I did a satellite book tour, which means you sit in a studio mm-hmm. and you there's 200 stations who are signed up for it. And you yeah. keep going from station to station to station. Unfortunately, like right before we started, the London bombings occurred. Day of. Like you're supposed to be in the like studio. Like an hour before oh I was God. starting. Satellite book tours, at least back then, that's like a 20K investment that your publisher makes in you. Right. Yeah. And so they were like, hey – but there was like a couple – there was like two dozen stations who yeah. still wanted me. I think they just wanted good news. Yeah. Like I think they needed something upbeat. Yeah. So that was that. Then I did – then IAMS hired me and then – So what did you do for IAMS? I did their pup- puppy training series. Video series? Yeah, and they flew me out to Atlanta. Yeah. And I was doing these outdoor videos for mm-hmm. them. And it was They did a script and it was, it was just 
great and yeah. wild. And when out, it was outdoors and it was in the summer. It was in Georgia. And oh, I remember wow. them paying the maintenance people to stop blowing the leaves. <laughs> And then the helicopters helicopters would fly over. It was yeah. it was a lot of stopping and starting. Yeah. With sound stuff. So but it was fun. I really liked it. Yeah. All right. So then from there, we then moved into so after the book, what actually plug the name of your book. Oh, Kathy Santos Dog Sons. Yep. Absolutely. And you can also you can get that on Amazon. We'll yep. put the link in there for you. And the content of the book, kind of go over like, so what was the book about? The book was about Training your dog, like figuring out who your dog was, Mm -hmm. what the personality, what would motivate him, Mm -hmm. because every dog is different, just like every person is different. Um, And uh, just understanding your dog and then how to do the basic stuff. Basic training. I would like to rewrite it as soon as (laughs) – Yeah, let's put that on the never-ending list. (laughs) Yes, yes, because, you know, we've – I've made changes and and things are, you know, different. But it's a really good book to help you understand the drives that your dog has and how to communicate with better. Yeah, awesome. All right, so then from there – Things kind of took off after that. Like you were in a huge kind of wave of media stuff. Yeah, the media stuff took off. There's a lot of Martha, the Today Show, Fox and Friends, a TBS movie and a makeover flew me out to Atlanta. I did a few of those episodes. That's awesome. Um, House, this is great. House Beautiful. The new editor said to me, he called me and he said, I'm a huge fan. Yeah. And so is my friend Ina Garten. And I am the new editor of House Beautiful, mm-hmm. and I got the job doing a mock-up of your column. I took your picture from the book, and I presented it, and they loved it. And it's called Ask the Dog Shrink, and I wanted to know if you would do it. That's amazing. And I was like, I would love to do it. That's awesome. Yeah. So, and then I, they, they took me out to the Hamptons, yeah. and we had this party, and I'm with all these big-name people. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like a dog trainer, but you're the most popular person in the room when you're a dog trainer. Yeah, when you're a dog trainer. Yeah. A dog. Um, AKC. They hired me to be a columnist. That's like how many years have I been doing that now? Like 15. Well, AKC, you're still with to this day. Right. I'm still their obedience columnist mm-hmm. and I'm their master trainer on mm-hmm. AKC TV. Yep. So for AKC TV, we'll get back to where we were in the story. But what you do currently for them is you do monthly video training series with them. I do. Jeez. I go on Ask the Expert yep. and now we're cooking up a little something and I will just keep everybody. All right, so some news coming as some well. Some news coming, yeah. It's exciting. Kathy never stops. Um, okay, so our, well, how about Martha? So when you're on, and we actually we do have some videos of when she was on Martha, so I, haha, I didn't tell her I was going to do this. I will share those videos. We'll put them in the link as well. The Martha stuff was so cool, though. So talk a little bit about, so you were basically, it was, it was kind of like a Q&A. Yeah, it was live TV, and so you walk on, and you never know what people are going to yeah. ask, but I love that. I love the the energy and the give and take of that. Martha is super cool. I loved yeah. her. She loved me. Um, she's very into dogs. Yeah. And we just had a really great working relationship. Yeah. You're going to listen to these Martha audios, <laughs> and you're going to say, it doesn't sound like her. This voice, yeah. I don't smoke. I don't drink. Like, yeah. none of it. But it is from overuse. I've ruined my voice. How many classes do you teach a week and for how many years? It's literally tens of thousands of dogs and hundreds of thousands of classes. It is. It is. And for at some point, I lost my octave and I couldn't say, yay. Yeah. So I went to a voice coach to get that back. That was all I cared about. You needed to be able to do the Mary Poppins dog training voice. Correct. <laughs> Correct. And now it's back. I don't love this octave, but okay, it's fine. I have it. All right, so then after all that media tour, from there, you're, then your in-person training stuff, your actual clients got a lot – you got obviously way busier. And that's when I had to make a decision. I had to say, do I want to be a media personality or do I want yeah. to do real-life dog training? Because it, we even I was even doing some writing stuff for Rachel Ray okay. for her pet food line and for her stuff with um, House Beautiful and, and Good Housekeeping both. And I just was like, you know what, I like – Handling people in person. Yeah. I like I like being with them through their journey. Mm-hmm. Because when I answer a question on TV, I don't know yeah. how they go with it. Like, yeah. and do you have a question? Oh, you can't ask me because our episode is over. Mm-hmm. So I, I made the decision to back off media and to just focus on the practice. Yeah. And that's what I did. And then it got huge. Yeah. All right. So started off in Ramsey. How'd you get the first location? Um, a friend of mine said, <laughs> we have a video store. Yeah. And we're, video is kind of like done. Mm-hmm. He has a little card, like Blockbuster, but they yeah. didn't have a Blockbuster. It was a private one. And they're like, do you want that storefront? And I was like, oh, my gosh, I don't know. Like, yeah. this is crazy. I don't know how to run a business. Like, mm-hmm. okay, <laughs> which is what I say to everything. Sure. But in my head, I'm like, oh, my gosh. So in like two months, I created a website yeah. and lesson sheets yeah. and curriculum. And then I'm in this little space. Like, mm-hmm. my family came in and we painted it and everything. And I'm like, 
okay, so I'm in this little space, like just me. Ooh. We're all my students. And I, it was really hard to get used to the idea that people could just show up and put their head in the door yeah. and say, hey, I, can I ask you questions? Because I was used to people calling me. Yeah. And it was just weird to be that accessible. Mm-hmm. Um, but it worked. And then it just got really big. Mm-hmm. So you started off with just group classes, private lessons. Right. And then it moved to daycare. Yep. And I didn't ever want to do daycare. Yeah. But – I had a student who was taking class, and she's like, oh, my God, my sister's plane is coming. Can I leave my dog with you? And I'm like, sure. So she left, and I was like, hello, dog. <laughs> what are we going to do now? Do the ball a couple times, took him out for a walk, yeah. brought him back in, set up some jumps, yeah, did some yeah. fool around, played with him. And then she came back, and she called me the next day and said he was so tired, and yeah. my sister and I want to go to the city. Can you watch him again? I'm like, okay. And so he came back, and she said, you should charge me. I'm like, sure. I had no idea. And then the next day, her friend called yeah. and said, I want to leave my dog because her dog was yeah. tired. And I said, oh, I only daycare with students yeah. who are training with me. And that was – I just decided that. But that's yeah. actually a really big deal. That's pivotal because that's the whole premise of the business now. Right. Keep my dog safe. Keep mm-hmm. my team safe. Yep. So all the students who bore with us, uh, who daycare with us, are actual in-training people. Yep. They're, they're not just off the street. And there's nothing wrong with that daycare model. Yeah. It was just – it wasn't me because yep. I'm a trainer. Yep. All right. So you had that one store, so that, and that's how pl- our play care program was born. Um, then from there, did you add in the training at that point for Fast Track? Then that started. Yeah. People would say, hey, I wanted to come to a class, but I have a flat tire. My yeah. kid threw up in the car. Can you just train the dog and let me pick him up? Yeah. And I'm like, okay, I should call that something. We, so we called it Fast Track because yeah. it really it is fast tracking your yeah. dog because when exactly. we train them, we get – the things done faster, Mm -hmm. but we loop the people in and we don't do it unless we can loop them in. We have to see them. Yeah, exactly. And that's where you came in. Yeah, absolutely. So then when we were in, so at the Ramsey location, you then got the store. We again, we kept getting bigger. You got the store next to it. Mm -hmm. I started off as a student first. Correct. um, And just fell in love with everything about it. So at the time I was still, I was managing retail. So at my nights, I asked Kathy, I was like, can I just come at nights to just clean crates? Like I'll do whatever you guys need. I just want to be like, I just want to be here. I love the vibe of everything. Like, everything that Kathy taught just, like, clicked with me. So then I started off working nights, just cleaning crates, walking dogs, basically as a playcare team member. And then, as Kathy does, she stole me. And she took me from my – that's how we get a lot of our people is we just steal them. Um, yeah, so I left my full-time retail job and started working on the Fast Track team that year. And that was about five years ago now. Yep. So we had the two Ramsey storefronts. Yep. School is getting bigger and bigger. Um, we added in boarding options. Um, and the grooming shop. Yep, the grooming shop as well. We had all those services available for our students. Um, and then we started looking at how – so then the next step of this was – then it was, you know, we need a bigger space. How are we going to continue to accommodate our growth in students and be able to provide that higher level of service that they expect from us? Right, and I think we knew we needed a new space for like three years. Yeah. But it was always the same story. Mm-hmm. It was the perfect space, but no zoning for dogs. Yeah. And then it was zoning for dogs, but there's not enough parking. Yeah. There's six parking spaces. I'm like, there's 50 <laughs> of us. Like, I yeah, don't know. Exactly. I have to get the a shuttle bus. Have a pack. Yeah, no. A parking spot. So then we found a place, like yeah. quite by accident. And then we just moved on it. Yeah. And I said, all right, 10 year lease, let's go. Yep. So we moved from Ramsey was how many square feet total? 1,300 in each space. So we had 2,600, 1,300 play care, 1,300 training. All right. How much How much do we have now? We have 16,000, including our outdoor space. 16,000 square foot facility. And the the incredible, like, we were able to add in so many services for our students as well. Oh, like, that's always, like, the big thing is, like, we always want to make sure that we're providing anything and everything that our students need for their dogs. Yep. They come first. They're the family. Yeah, exactly. So that's why we put a grooming shop there. Mm-hmm. And we have a water treadmill. Yep. And we do agility. Mm-hmm. And we do pretty much we do every- got, Yeah, we have multiple indoor outdoor play yards, multiple training spaces, group classes, private lesson areas. The facility is absolutely beautiful. It really is. And when the Rona hit, so we moved in November of 19, mm-hmm. 2019. Yep. And a few months later, a little thing <laughs> called the Rona hit. Just a little pandemic yeah, thing. Quick little pandemic. And I'm like, wow, I signed a 10 year <laughs> lease and now I have no business. Woohoo. Um, but we stayed open. Yeah. We had a few team members who felt comfortable staying. Yeah. And we were providing daycare for people who are doctors yeah. and police officers and nurses and the, just, you know, emergency people. Yeah. Grocery store workers, you want your groceries, right? Yeah. So they're not going to leave their dog home for 18 hours. Mm-hmm. So we stayed open. And at one point, we had like four dogs. And yeah. I was like, all right, you know what? We're going to clean everything then. <laughs> so 
<laughs> and we just we just made it through our social media, which I was so proud of, which Sarah also runs. Yep. Um, is it was all positive. Yeah. You would not know if you scrolled through our stuff. The only thing you'd see is like, oh, curbside pickup. Yeah. We changed that. Yep. We just wanted our students to be happy. And also virtual classes took off in a huge way for us because our family, like our dog training family, a lot of times these people are seeing us in group classes because while we're training facility first and foremost, we require our students to train every two weeks with us. So that means fast track, you know, boarding, group classes, private lessons, whatever kind of training you like best you can use. But a lot of times it's in group classes and all of a sudden we lost this connection to our students. So we added in the virtual group classes and like, we, had, we could have up to like 30 people in a group class because in the virtual classes, we didn't have to limit how many people because of Correct. space or anything. We did, you know, free live Q&As. We had people from all over the country tuning into those live Q&As. Yeah. Those we, were wild. We did a lot of freebies. It was so much fun, though. And I think what we were thinking, and like I knew the day it shut down, I said to somebody on the team, this is going to be bad because people are going to be home and yeah. they're going to have dogs. They're going to handle them badly. The stress is going to impact. We're going to get a lot of bites. Yep. And what we didn't think of was there's going to be a lot of new dogs. Like, I didn't think of that yeah. at all. I, I didn't. No. I, we, we didn't know how long it was going to last. We didn't know what it was about. Sarah's in Colorado. Yes. Because that's where she's from. Yep. That's another thing. So, yeah. yeah. So, I'm now, I now run a Colorado location for the school. So, I just do um, private lessons, um, in homes, board and trains, that kind of thing. We're moving on a facility soon out there. So, we'll have the similar. So, it'll be like a little mini version of the New Jersey one. But I'm out in Colorado as well. So, I was able to jump into the, the virtual group classes and everything, but we really didn't know what was going to happen. And then the pandemic puppies started. Yes. And that's where that pandemic puppy video series came from. Yep. We would do one a month. Yep. And we would just help people. It would be a yep. topic, management, mm -hmm. socialization, like what you can do during the Rona. And that's when that's when we started our video series, Puppy yep. Prep School. Yep. And exactly. that's how that all came to be. And then we got, I think it was two months into the Rona, the other side of the building came available. Yes. And they're like, if you don't want it, somebody else does. But it was literally linked. And guess what Kathy said? I said, yes. Sure. <laughs> yes, of, of course. course. You're going to open another side and buy construction yeah. things. And yeah, it was just, but it was a good decision. It was too good of an opportunity. It, you had to do yeah, it. Exactly. And so I bit the bullet. Did what I had to do, and now we have a huge facility, and we're really happy. Yeah, it's incredible. And we have also – what also happened a little bit before we moved into um, the Waldock facility is we started doing the online courses as well because mm -hmm. we wanted to be able to have options for students who couldn't reach us in person to still be able to get that same level of training. And during coronavirus and all of that, we were able to then provide these services to all these people who, even, who either couldn't get to the school or they weren't comfortable coming in for classes when we did eventually start back up with group classes outside and everything. The Having those online courses – was a huge resource for them. Thank God. We've been in the online yeah. space for years. Yeah. And people who were, when this thing happened, people didn't, other trainers, they didn't yeah. know. I mean, they could barely put a website together. Yeah. So when they were looking at Zoom, they had no idea. But we already had the infrastructure yep. that we could sort of lean on and help get us through. Yep. It was great. It was a learning curve for a lot of people in the <laughs> industry. But I think it was good, though, because they also were then able to, like, build their confidence and know, like, I can provide these services, which then helps all those other people out there with the pandemic puppies and also with the people who got a lot of rescue dogs, too. And they didn't, like we talked about earlier, the shelters, they do the absolute best that they can. But you don't always know what's in a dog. And then, you know, you adopt the dog, you fall in love with it. And then after the honeymoon period, some behaviors start coming out that yes. may not be desirable. Yeah, you adopt the story, not always yeah. the dog. Yeah. And then you fall in love with the dog. And, th I mean, that's why we do this. We want to help keep these dogs with their families as best we can, whatever we can do to help them. That's why we have all these services available. We want to be able to keep these dogs with their families. And that's why we're doing the podcast. Yeah. Because this is another way of getting great training information, yeah. too. And as soon as we're done with this one and talking about ourselves, <laughs> then we're going to get on to the great stuff, yeah. the takeaway content, yeah, as they say exactly. in the biz. All right. So where are we? Do we wrap it all up? We, I mean, I think that we've covered all pieces of the story, kind of where we're at now. <laughs> you guys got the long story. And now, I mean, I think everyone has like, so, but it's so important with that origin story to know that you're not just one of these online dog trainer. We are not these online dog trainers who read a book or took an online course or something and are now claiming <laughs> that we know what we're doing, right? We literally, Kathy, literally, the New Jersey school sees over 500 dogs a week in group classes, private lessons, play care, fast track, boarding, all of these different services. We are in the trenches with our students every single day. And we want to be able to bring that content to other students as well. If in our puppy classes, we're hearing the same questions over and over and over again, we know that you guys have them too, right? We know you're probably going through these same issues and we want to be able to help you guys too. 
Yeah, there's a lot of online dog trainers that aren't. <laughs> Be very careful when you – we always try to tell people where we get the phone calls from people who – they're like, ah, oh, yeah, I looked at some YouTube videos. You know, I Googled some things that we're just like – I literally tell people to break the internet, and I, I'm like, <laughs> not in a, stop not in that googling. Way. <laughs> no, I say, you know how yeah. when you get a medical diagnosis, yeah. you should not go online. Exactly. And people Web come and they, they think you're right. Die. They tell me all these things. Like I read on the internet, I'm like, yeah. let me stop you right there. Yeah. Don't say that again. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing is setting you back. So that's our purpose. Provide great content that really works that we use every day in our classes, and we'll help you guys out. Yeah. All right. So stay tuned for our next episode. I promise nothing about us and everything about your dogs and what you want to know. All right. Thanks, Sarah. Awesome. It was great to talk to you guys, and we hope to see you guys in the next episode. 